I want to start by thanking the organizer for uh, inviting me here. I'm very happy to present some work about multi-terminal Josephson junctions. And I talk about topological properties, so there is some connection with the uh, previous talk. But um, as I will show you, it's a different kind of topological properties. I'm not talking about topological superconductivity, and I'm not going to talk about Majoranas either. Um, so this is work done together um, with my colleague Manuel Luce in Grenoble, Yuli Nasarov, who is a frequent visitor to Grenoble as well, and with two former postdocs, Roman Vivar and um, Eric Erickson. So um, topological phases have been talked about a lot in, in recent years, and um, the basic idea is that they are systems um, topological insulators and superconductors, well one example is the Kitaev chain that you just heard about. So these systems have a gap in the bike and topologically protected surface states, which in the case of the Kitaev chain are these um, Majoranas, um, for example. There are also topological um, semi-metals or states that don't have a bulk gap, where, but where these topologically protected states appear in um, the bulk and they're uh, topologically protected band crossings. Um, so the idea I want to talk about is that usually this is some material property that gives you the topological property. So you have some kind of band structure, either in a native material or um, engineered by kind of proximity effect, um, as discussed now. And um, what we want to talk about is rather devices, where um, you take a material that is not very unconventional, but by building a device out of it, you can get um, new properties. So what's shown here is um, a cross of two nanowires, then coupled to four leads. These four leads could be superconductors. And the basic idea is that by looking at the devices, you have some other degrees of freedom which can determine your effective dimensionality and you can make something like an artificial um, material. So um, the analogy we use to um, describe these materials is actually quite simple. So if you think about just the usual um, Josephson junctions, you have two superconductors that are coupled by something in the middle. In the simplest case, an insulating barrier. It could also be um, some metal or some more complicated material. Each superconductor has a gap and a phase. And so if you couple those, you have a, a, an energy of the system that depends on the phase difference between two, your su two superconductors. And this energy difference then actually leads to a current in the junction. So this is just the simplest case. Your energy depends on cosine of the phase difference. So you get the usual um, Josephson relation where you have a, a sinusoidal current. In general, if you don't have just an insulator here, you can um, get a more complicated phase dependence. And typically, it's described by the formation of Andreev bound states in this junction. And the main part of the current is carried by these Andreev bound states. So you just have to compute the energy of these bound states, and then you take the relative respect to phase. Again, you get the current um, in the system. While um, the current has been measured for a long time, a direct observation of these Andreev states is a little more recent. And here, I'm showing an experiment um, from the Clegg group, where they really showed the, the subgap states as a function of the phase um, difference. And the main point uh, um, that I want to stress here is the systems we are interested are this kind of system, where you have a, a junction which carries only a few channels, and as a result, you get a discrete Andreev spectrum in the end. You've already heard more about bigger junctions, say diffusive junctions, where you have many channels, and here you get a dense or continuous um, subgap spectrum. Here we really want to look at what happens when you have a discrete um, spectrum. So this can fairly easily be generalized to a junction with more terminals. So you uh, imagine you have some central region that is now not coupled to only two superconductors, but um, say an arbitrary number of them. Then your uh, the energy of the Andreev bound states, or also the continuum states, will not depend only on one parameter, but on all the phase differences. And um, as in a two-terminal junction, you have only one independent phase. If you have n terminals, you have n minus one independent um, phases. So the basic idea I want to exploit is, if you have an n-terminal junction, as I said, you have n minus one um, independent uh, phases, and you have a band structure, basically, which depends on these phases. You have n minus one parameters. The energy is periodic in them. The superconducting properties are two pi periodic in the phases. So you can look at the entry of band spectrum as the band structure of these artificial materials where the phase differences basically play the role of quasi-momenta. And you can look 
now at, well, typically one looks at the spectrum, but what we learned from real materials is that there's more than just the spectrum. If you really look at how the wave functions behave, you can get um, topological um, properties. So let me show you the main result before going to some more details. So what we find is that if you have at least four terminals, you can get um, topologically protected wave singularities in the entry wave um, spectrum. So an example is shown here, and the ones that are interesting are actually wave singularities where two states cross at exactly zero energy. And um, as a result, you can, um, well, one thing you could do is just try to do spectroscopy and see these crossings. That might be actually difficult, but what you find is that these um, singularities have repercussions even if you look at what happens far away um, from the singularities. And um, basically the simplest experiment, I'll show you later why it maybe is not as simple as I um, claim here, is that if you apply then voltages to some of the terminals, you can measure a quantized transconductance um, similar as in a, a quantum hall system actually. So you get a sort of quantum hall effect, um, but without a, a magnetic field. <coughs> so um, now I'm coming to the outline, so I'll um, briefly uh, remind you what these wild singularities are. Then um, show you the Andrea Bonstein spectrum for these multi-terminal junctions, talk about the quantized transconductance, and this is basically the main results for this analogy between multi-terminal junctions and topological materials. In the last part, I'll show you why maybe it's not as simple as it looks. Okay, so um, the Weil Hamiltonian is basically Hamiltonian in a three-dimensional system where the energy is just linear in all three momentum. And so it's a, 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 a system with two bands for any k, so you can write the Hamiltonian as a two by two matrix, and any two by two matrix, except for a global shift in energy, so for unity matrix, you can express in terms of the three Pauli matrices. So basically the idea is each k couples to one Pauli matrix. Now, what is topological about this is basically that you can't just open a gap in this um, crossing between your um, states at, at the while point. And um, this can characterized, be characterized by a topological charge, meaning such a while point um, carries a topological charge which is related to the Berry curvature. And the Berry curvature basically measures how the wave functions depend um, as a function of your control parameter as you vary through the Brion zone. The, so for the usual case, this would be um, just the momentum. So you have two possibilities. Um, the charge can be plus or minus one, um, basing a, a mo monopole and an anti-monopole. And um, you can see that this is just related to this um, velocity matrix that's standing in front of your while Hamiltonian. Now this has been discovered in, in recent materials and there are a lot of um, experiments ongoing. These materials are typically um, fairly complicated and um, there's interest in, in seeing how one can get something like this in a simpler system. Now, um, switching to something slightly different. So here I'm showing you something that's related to a Berry curvature. So basically to get this Berry curvature, you have to, uh, to get the topological charge of the while point, you have to integrate over a closed surface around um, this while point. Another place where the Berry curvature appears is the churn number in a two-dimensional system. So this is what characterizes the quantum Hall effect. So it's the same quantity, the Berry curvature, but now it's integrated over a different surface. I mean here it's integrated over your two-dimensional Brillouin zone rather than this closed surface. And the two are actually related. So if you look at a three-dimensional system which has these um, while points, and now consider taking two-dimensional slices. So you fix one of the momenta and um, compute the integral over the Berry curvature just over a two-dimensional plane. What you will find in that case is that if you look at the difference between the churn number you get, say, on this plane and this plane, it's determined by the charge of the while point that sits in between them. So every time you cross with your control parameters at the while point, your churn number changes by the charge of this um, while point. So that means you have a link between the, the uh, appearance of the singularity in, say, three dimensions, and then the churn number in um, two dimensions. 
And the germ number is, as I said, what characterizes topological phases in two-dimensional um, systems. So if you have a non-zero germ number, you would get edge states and the quantum Hall effect in the usual case. And it's this um, analogy that I want to exploit later for my um, junctions as well. So, so now... So you're, you're breaking the general rules of chemistry. So you, the number of the... Uh, I mean, it does all that. Uh, some of the gen numbers does not have to be zero. So um, the, um, the sum of the gen number... So what breaks time reversal here, you can assume that the total system is time reversal invariant. In that case, you would have not... They appear in pairs. Yes. But what breaks time reversal is that here the KZ would break time reversal. So at a fixed value of KZ, yeah, you yeah. can get a non-zero non return number. But the number of file points, yes. So, you <laughs> um, so now let's turn to junctions. I don't think for this audience I have to explain what the Andreev reflection is. Um, so the idea is you can't transfer a, charge, a single charge into a superconductor at subgap energy, so you get Andreev reflections, and the thing we want to see is how does that manifest itself in these uh, multi-terminal junctions. Um, so you basically can look at what happens if you have a, a particle, say, hitting your central scatterer here. It can be normally reflected an electron as an electron to any of, of the other leads. Once it hits the superconducting lead, it will be Andreev reflected at a subgap energy. Uh, don't, this is a hole, and then the scatterer again can dispatch it into any other superconductor as a hole, where it comes back as an electron, and so on. So these processes can um, lead to bound states, and um, uh, the formula for determining the bound state spectrum has been given by Benacker, where we can actually write a fairly simple formula separating the normal state scattering properties from the Andreev um, processes. So as N describes the normal scattering of the scattering matrix, which transfers um, particles to particles, holes to holes, and um, for a short junction, this is basically energy independent, so you have just some transmission and reflection amplitudes, and the Andreev reflection matrix that describes the Andreev reflection at each superconductor, and this Andreev reflection matrix depends both on the energy and on the phase phases here on the phases of all superconductors. So for each one ray of reflection at a given superconductor, it will pick up the phase of that um, superconductor. So if you have multiple reflection, eventually your state can, in principle, explore all the different phases from, from your, all your leads. So the solutions, in the end, for a given phase um, are possible only at given energies to this energy dependence here. And we consider a system which has spin rotation invariance and um, time reversal symmetry. So you find, and then in the superconductor is particle hole symmetry. So in effect, all the states come in pairs at energies plus and minus E. So if you find a state at uh, energy E, you always find a state at minus energy E as well. So if you want to look at a state at zero energy, which we are interested in here is, basically it means it's not a single state, it's a crossing of two states. So that means you have to look where you find a doubly degenerate solution of um, your equation that determines um, the eigenspectrum. This is quite different from the Majorana case. So here we talk about conventional superconductors, we have these symmetries, so it is two states. So that means if you really want to look at just the crossing of two states, Again, it's a two by two Hamiltonian. You have two states that cross, so you can write your low energy Hamiltonian in the vicinity of this crossing as a two by two matrix. And then for a two by two matrix, you don't have that many choices. Again, you have your three Pauli matrices and you get some prefactors. And typically, um, well, if you start expanding around this crossing point, well, the corrections will be <laughs> linear. So that means here you get back as a general <laughs> principle, you get back to your Weil um, Hamiltonian. And um, the main thing is here, well, you have three Pauli matrices, so you need to tune three parameters of your Hamiltonian to get to zero energy. So that means if your system has three tunable parameters, you have enough degrees of freedom to get to zero energy. So in general, if you have a two-terminal junction, you have only one parameter, which is phase, so you need to tune something else to get to zero energy. If you have 
three terminals, you have two phases. If you have four terminals, you have three phases. That means as soon as you have four terminals, the phases alone give you enough parameters to tune your energy and possibly realize such a vital point. So is there a reason to uh, forget about the sigma zero, not tau zero? Because um, it could also be phase dependent and, and then you can have a type two. You can also, you can also get crossings at higher energies. So here we, we look specifically at zero energy crossing. You can also have two states cross no, I at the finite that. energy. Ah, okay. So do you get rid of the tau zero at zero energy? I mean that at zero energy. Zero, sort of the, the zero uh, that depends on, on, on phase, you can also have a problem. Well, uh, well actually, you have particle hole symmetry, so you can't move it okay. up or okay. down. <laughs> okay. So the the tau zero, if you uh, yeah, it's due to particle hole symmetry that that you can't have it in this case. Um. <laughs> So once you are down to this two by two Hamiltonian, you can basically use the same things you used for the usual mild Hamiltonian. It will have a topological charge if you look at a three dimensional subspace. And again, it's just related to how um, the phases are linked to the Pauli matrices. Um, something that was the question in the beginning, I guess the total topological charge of the system has to be zero. Here, in addition, we assume that the system is time reversal invariant, which actually means that if we have a wild point at some set of phases, we'll have another one with the same charge when we reverse all the phases. Um, so as a consequence, in this kind of system, we had would, if we have wild singularities, they always come in multiples of four. So that means the simplest thing we could have is, um, say, as a function of my three phases now in a four terminal junction, we have these four wild points two of the same charge, which are just obtained by um, reversing um, the signs of the phases, and then two other ones at some different set of phases that can be unrelated to the first set of phases. That means now, if we look at our Andreev spectrum, if we take a cut exactly through such a wild point as a function of these, of so we fix two of the phases at the, to a wild point, we will find we have this crossing at zero energy, if we fix the two other phases to some other value, we will have a gap in our Andreev spectrum. So we have states above and below the gap that are well um, separated from each other. Um, coming back to what I told you in the beginning is if we have wild points, we have churn numbers. So we can choose one of the phases as a control parameter. That means if we then compute our churn number for this two dimensional slice, um, it jumps every time we cross a wild point. In principle, it doesn't tell you as what the value of the churn number is, but we know that if phi 3 is zero, the system is actually time reversal invariant, so we know that the churn number has to be zero here, and then we can compute the other values just by looking at the uh, charges of the wild points. So that means if we have wild points, we have slices with non-zero um, churn number. So that means, again, the wild points affect what happens even far from where they are positioned. Now, so far I only used general um, arguments. That doesn't mean such wild points would be realized in a in, in real system. After all, not every three-dimensional material is a wild semi-metal. That would be the same argument. You have three parameters, you should get wild singularities. So what we looked at is um, simple toy models as well as um, random scattering matrices to describe these junctions and we found that, well, for the random scattering matrices, basically the chance of realizing such wild points for a single uh, general junction is 5%. So it's definitely not every junction, but the, the um, percentage is not negligible either. For simple toy models, we find that, once, uh, that there are uh, significant uh, regimes of parameters where you should actually be able to get um, wild singularities. If you increase the number of channels, the chance of getting wild points goes up significantly. You can get more than just four wild points. On the other hand, um, as I'll show you later, this is maybe not the way to go because these wild points move closer and closer together. And um, as I'll show you, to see something in the vicinity of the wild point is actually um, quite tricky. But so the message here is it is possible with some simple model um, to get these wild points in a, in a four terminal junction. So then the next question, how to observe them. 
uh, rather than doing spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is tricky because distinguishing between no gap and a very small gap is actually not um, obvious. Um, so the quantity we want to look at is actually the current um, in our um, Josephson junction. So in the beginning I told you the Josephson current is the uh, derivative of the energy with respect to phase. Well, here is the same thing written as an operator, so the current is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to phase. If I compute this for constant phases, I will get what I told you in the beginning. What we want to look at is actually what happens if we vary these phases um, slowly. So if you apply voltages, you know, to the chosen relation, the phases will vary. And um, this is the case we want to look at. So if this variation is slow enough, you can compute the current using um, an instantaneous basis. So at any time, you just take the values of the phases at a time and get um, the eigenstates of the system. And then you find that your current then um, has an adiabatic part, which is what I showed you before. So just the derivative of the energy with respect to the phase. But actually, not only the energy depends on phase, now also the wave functions depend on phase. So in addition to this adiabatic superconduct, you can compute corrections. So they are proportional here to the velocity of the phase, to phi dot, and then the derivative of the wave function with respect to phase. And this is actually just the Berry curvature now as a function of phase rather than momentum. So your first correction, non-adiabatic correction to the current, depends on the Berry curvature of your spectrum. Now, the total current, you have to sum over all the states, you have to take into account if the states are occupied or not. But again, you have um, your adiabatic supercurrent, which should be an AC current once your um, uh, phases depend on time, and you have this um, first correction. So the specific setup we propose is for a four-terminal junction, so you um, connect two of your terminals into a loop, such that with a magnetic flux you can control the phase difference between um, those two, and you apply some small voltages to the other two terminals. So again, as I already mentioned, if you apply a voltage, you have your Josephson relation, so your phases vary linearly with time. And if the phases are, um, uh, if the voltages are incommensurate, you will actually sweep your entire two-dimensional plane over time. Of you, you will explore all the values of the phases phi 1 and phi 2 after some time. So that means if you average then your current over time, well, the first one is an AC current in the presence of these applied voltages, so will it will average to zero. The second one, your phi dot is, is constant. So the only thing that depends on time or on phase in the end is um, your Berry curvature, and you integrate it over all values of the phase, and this is what I told you before, the churn number. So you integrate your Berry curvature over your two-dimensional on so now in phases, and you get a churn number. So that means that your average current in the end is related to the churn number that you have in the system. So your conductance is, um, well, the quantization is um, 2 e squared over pi h bar, and then the churn number, which is an integer. So that means um, I showed you this picture before where I said this was the churn number. In fact, due to this relation, this would also be the transconductance between these two terminals that are biased with a small voltage that you should measure in such a setup. So this is actually the main result. So you can realize wire singularities. You can see them not only by doing spectroscopy and seeing band crossings. Since they um, result in these finite churn numbers, you can basically measure their effect even when you are far from the singularity itself via this um, quantized um, conductance. So why is it not that simple? Well, as I said before, it depends on all the states and it depends on their occupation. Actually, if you have an Andreev state, it gives one current if it's occupied. If you, uh, uh, if you remove the particle, it gives the opposite current. Um, so Everything I showed you so far and what people usually look at is what happens in the ground state. So all the states below the Fermi energy are occupied, all the states above the Fermi energy are empty. If that's not the case and you change these occupations, then you will get some different results. 
This could be to quasi-particle poisoning, if you have quasi-particles around that get trapped <laughs> in these states. But there's actually another effect which is completely unavoidable. As soon as you apply a voltage, you have actually processes um, where um, particles go from below the gap edge above the gap edge. And in this um, case, you can think about landau sehner um, transition between these states. So um, the easiest thing is to look at in this picture. So again, I'm taking cuts along some trajectory through my phase of, of spaces that I want to sweep with a voltage. If I'm cutting through a while point, well, I have a zero energy crossing. If I'm cutting somewhere else, I have a gap in my spectrum. So that means if I want to um, vary my phases and really go through a while point, there is no way I'm conserving the occupations. There is no gap, so if I come from here, my particle will typically stay here for a while and go above the Fermi energy. So if I'm at the while point, typically I will get dissipation because my quasi there is no gap, so my quasi-particles just will occupy states above the Fermi level eventually. If I'm in the situation where there is a gap, I have a clear distinction between occupied and empty states. And if I vary the phases slowly enough, there's a chance that I stay in the ground state. However, if um, my voltage is non-zero, I will always have a small probability to going up and the probability will increase with the voltage. <coughs> so if that happens, well, it's not completely lost. If there are some inelastic processes, I can relax back to, to my ground state. So in, in if I want to measure something that um, corresponds to equilibrium properties, I need some um, relaxation in order to get back to the ground state. So what we did to check that is now do a full current calculation where we have multiple and of reflections, and we can compute the currents using um, flow case scattering theory. And um, well, what I tried to say you, we have to take into account some kind of inelastic processes. And the simplest way to do this is just assume a Dines parameter such that the, um, um, the gap in the leads is not completely sharp, so you have some subgap states to which the particles can escape if they're in a non-equilibrium uh, occupation. So um, we choose a specific scattering matrix. For simplicity, we take um, commensurate voltages for the calculation and an average over phases. But again, the, the idea is the same. You can cover the entire prion zone. So you can compute currents, which is not that interesting. But once we have currents, we can compute the conductances. So what I'm showing you here is the conductances in these two terminal junctions, where um, in blue and pink are the uh, longitudinal conductance, so G11, G22. And the transconductances here are in red and green. So at very high voltage, you just get your normal state conductances, since it's time reversal symmetric, G12 and G21 are the same. As you decrease voltage, you get in a multiple entry of reflection regime, which is very complicated, and you get peaks and dips and, and whatever. And eventually, once you get to low enough voltages, you get these quantized values that I announced before. So your longitudinal conductances go to zero, so you have no more dissipation in the system, whereas your transconductances take these opposite um, quantized um, values. And the typical scale where this quantization is reachable is related to this landau sehner tunneling um, that I talked about. So what you see from there, it is related to this gap. So you want to have zero energy crossings, but once you go away from the zero crossings, you basically want to, this gap to be as large as possible to be able to do something adiabatic. That's why multi-channels uh, probably is not useful because your while points are close enough together and your typical spacing between states um, will be small. And again, for comparison, if you are in a regime where it's non-topological, everything got, should go to zero, zero at these low um, voltages. And finally, before it was a function as voltage, now it's as a function as phase. You nicely see the quantized um, plateaus between the while points. At the while points, there's no way of being adiabatic. You states cross zero and you get a big mess. Um, I guess I'm basically out of time. So just the last two slides. Um, in the beginning, I said we need four terminals. It's not completely true. You can have an additional parameter in a two terminal, uh, three terminal junction where you have only two independent phases. And the easiest parameter you can think of is just um, applying a flux through the junction area. And then you get basically the same physics now 
with um, your three parameters being the flux and the two phases. With one difference, um, what we found in general is that um, for the four terminal junctions, we could really relate these topological properties to the Jur numbers associated with bound states. In this case, we typically find that the bound states actually carry a Jur number that's different from the conductance we get in the end. That means also the continuum contributes. So an important message, it's, it's not a si property of a single state. You really have to consider everything that's below um, the Fermi level. So let me finish. Um, so we've um, studied the properties of multi-terminal Josephson junction. And we um, found that using this analogy between superconducting phases and quasi-momenta, we can identify topological um, properties. In particular, we can find um, bisingularities that are tuned by the phases alone, so you don't have to fine-tune the junction parameters. Um, it can be measured afar from the wild points by looking at this um, quantized um, transconductance. And um, this is an analogy that we have explored in some simple cases, but in principle um, could go further. Um, in particular, now our dimensionality is limited only by the number of terminals we have, so we could look at topological properties of systems in larger than three dimensions, which you can't do in real materials. So thank you for your attention, and I leave you with the conclusion.